My name's The Secret. <laughs> My tag is GTM, and I'd say I'm relatively known for it, mostly just like Super Mario 64 speedrunning. I've uh, been doing a little bit of Melee, but most of the Melee people, they just recognize me as the Mario 64 speedrunner that plays Melee, besides Armada. I mean, yeah, that's about it. Those are, those are the main two communities I dwell in. Um, Mario 64 Spirit obviously being more of my home. Uh, I've been getting a little bit into NES Tetris. Uh, it's been pretty fun, just learning fundamentals and all that. Life growing up was r relatively simple. Like, I know everyone has like their own like grievances with life, you know. Everyone complains about small things because like it gets to them from their own perspective. But when I when I look at it objectively, it's it was a pretty simple life. I really don't have any complaints, you know, nothing particularly bad. My parents immigrated from Mexico to the United States to have a better life in many such cases. One of the earliest memories I have is playing on my sister's Game Boy Advance. It was a red one. Um, I don't remember the game I was playing. They were pretty big into Narnia at the time and there was a Narnia game for, for that console. Um, and I, I remember, I, I lived in a trailer at this point and my mom, like, it, it was raining. My mom carried me on her shoulder to go pick up my sisters from, where, from wherever. She just had me covered in a blanket because it was raining. I was just playing on that Game Boy Advance. Overall, uh, most of my life pretty much just surrounded by completely like Nintendo consoles. I think the next console I probably played was the GameCube because my parents had gone to flea markets just, you know, to buy my sister's stuff. I mean, I guess Nintendo consoles, like, overall were more so marketed toward kids. They're there for everyone and all that. So my introduction to speed, like, it's hard to think back exactly because there were many points where I had, I had seen a speed run online, but I didn't really think much of it. I was just like, okay, well, that's just like gameplay. But I was like, I, a lot of people, when they see a speed run, they're like, whoa, this is cool. Or they see a task and they're like, who's TAS? I never had any of those experiences. Um, my introduction to speed run was a bit more different. So Kay's Emmanuel, German ROM hacker, he's created many popular SM64 ROM hacks. A lot of them have gone viral. A lot of them got taken down by Nintendo, as is the case with most fan games. So around 2017, he releases like Super Mario Maker 64. It was very primitive, um, but like it was viral because like 2017, like no one was really making like cool conceptual hacks like he was at the time. So Case is like, hey, I'm gonna start streaming on Twitch now. Check it out if you want to. I'll be making my ROM hacks. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested in seeing how the hacks are made. So I start watching. I'm a bit more, and I think whenever E3 2017 was, they revealed Super Mario Odyssey, I'm pretty sure. And they showed the, you know, the whole capture stuff. So he makes a ROM hack that's just a basic physics mod where you add Cappy. Um, but the physics mod was very broken because you could capture pretty much anything the game considers an object in SM64, including doors. So I, I played it a bit for fun, but then one time when he's uh, making another update to that hack, he was messing around and he captures the moat door and when you capture any object, again, you can, you can move it as kind of like his Odyssey, but just like jankier. So he captures the moat door and he takes it to dry land so he can walk through it. And then you're in basement. So I was like, wait, that's interesting. Maybe I should, maybe I should try speed running it. My first ever, I guess, proper speed run with a timer, which at the time was W split because Simple Flips used it. Uh, my first proper official speed run was of that physics hack mod. I remember tried practicing like some other strats before I saw that moat thing just like for fun because like you know you could capture anything. Then after a while that physics mod like you know I, I came up with a couple things mostly like you so in Odyssey when you like ground pound dive onto Cappy um, you can only do that like once or twice before it runs out but you could do that infinitely with the physics mod. So after you capture the moat door you go to fire scene you pretty much just like do a bunch of like infinite uh, Cappy bounces and then you get into the fire sea stage. I think the only actual proper thing I had discovered in that hack was just like if you hold L, your inputs get buffered after file select, and by holding L, you throw Cappy. So you just completely skip the intro. So for the very small niche community, uh, that, that, that was big. And then later on, 2017 that year, I think this is around like late 2017, apparently I had started following Cheese like December 2017 too, but I, I don't have a very good memory of that. Um, so I followed Cheese 2017. He's, I think at this point he's probably grinding for 139. Then around like May, April, whenever Ouija got his 15, 17, 16 star record, I had seen that, and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should start speedrunning vanilla SM64. And I went in thinking that I would be able to get a 15 very easily. Like it'd be fast. Like yeah, you, know, you know, I just got to do a couple strats, and the 15 should be easy, which. It was very ignorant of me and it took me till like May 2020 for me to get my actual first 15 and 16 star.
but that that was pretty much like that was like Odyssey is like the genesis, and then uh, uh, Ouija's record is what like really catapulted me into vanilla SM64. And since then, I've pretty much only done 16 star, but you know I got plans uh, for more categories soon. So a lot of the way that I gained notoriety and like through notoriety and like more people watching me was his motivation. The way I gained all of that was mostly through uh, watching Zufi a bunch. Um, Cause like, you know, the pandemic had just hit and Zufi started streaming a lot more regularly. And I knew Zufi through Slippery Nip's chat cause he was a mod there. Um, and I, I was always watching Slippery Nip cause you know, he was a little enigmatic at the time, you know. Um, he didn't use microcam, which always made it pretty interesting. Um, but I'd say 2020, all throughout that year, I'd, I'd play Mario whenever Zufi wasn't live, play a little bit before he's live. Um, and I think I ended the year with a 15-24. And at the time, that I think it beat Zaya. And at the time, it was also top 10. Um, so I'd say hitting top 10 with a time like that uh, was probably when I started thinking, maybe, maybe I could really push this a lot further. It might have been my 15-31 or my 15-24 that I posted those splits and I said, long-term, I either want OX or 14 now. Um, so pretty much 2020 and then 2021 onwards is when I really started feeling like I was starting to improve. I was getting a lot more eyes on me. Um, Cause I'm sure a lot of people in the community, they probably know me through just like me yapping in Twitch chats as is, you know, as, that's, that's kind of my whole deal when I'm not playing. They either see me yapping or they see me playing. Um, combination of both is really what helped me gain a stronger following and you know like I said earlier stronger following more motivation to play because there's more people to entertain I suppose <sighs> honestly I don't know it's it's too difficult to say I feel like in a lot of cases a lot of people just like start speedrunning mm. at a young age like this particular game um, and then they just kind of get used to the physics that's not to say the phys physics are bad but it's just like you you get so used to the physics over the years that like it just like it becomes um intuitive to the player i don't know it's, it's just so difficult to describe the actual intricacies um there's just a lot of depth there's a lot of stuff about like tight lines like in tasting it gets like so much deeper that i, I couldn't even begin to explain in order to get a 563 miscellaneous time on the door touch at the start of hmc you like some arced in straining which I, I don't even know what that is but there was like a desmos animation graph and like i don't know shit about math but at that point, I was like, yeah, this, shit, this shit's getting kind of deep, which made me begin to wonder what like, the future of the game would begin to look like. Because if the future of the game is more of that stuff with speedrunning, then like, it makes me think of Melee and how like, there's always just so much depth to everything. Like, you think you know this, and there's like 20 other things you got to look into and start understanding. So honestly, I think SM64 movement's only going to get even more and more intricate as time goes on. Hardest strats. It depends on the perspective of the player, because if you have a good enough fundamental understanding of all the movement in SM64, mm -hmm. then I feel like it's not that crazy to just like try and learn everything. Like you, even crazier strats like Flag Eyeless. You just kind of learn specific things unique to the start. And I think, I think the harder part of learning more difficult strats is learning the things that are unique to it, or like certain angles you want to take, or like certain things you have to feel out, as people say. Um, I think I struggled the most with uh, ultimate bits, which is task long jump plus the ultimate ending with a fancy side flip on the elevators. I definitely struggled with that the most, but um, I started being more analytical with my practice and just like being more disciplined with how I want to analyze my own gameplay, what visual cues I should look for. And now I'd say that's probably one of my more easier things I can go for in practice because like I, I think if I were to boot up the game right now with my controller and all that stuff, like I, there's a decent chance, like within a couple of tries, I could probably get a good completion of that uh, stage in. Cause like I said, I analyze so much to the point where like, even if I'm like half assing practice and focus, I should still be able to get it. If I apply that same principle to pretty much everything else in 16 star, I guess like, you know, other categories, once I start learning them, then I don't think there will be anything particularly difficult. I think the, the mental aspect of the game will, will make things a lot harder. So there's like, there, there's two sides to me handling pace. So like the first side is like, I try and read Twitch chat and like maybe I'll, you know, I'll try to crack a joke. Mm -hmm. Not to make myself less nervous because I'm like, I'm pretty confident in the fact that no matter anything I try to do to make myself less nervous, like physically, like my hands are going to start trembling at some point in the run, usually like bits or Bowser throws. So there, there's really nothing to stop that. Um, so I just kind of like try to, try to make the most of the moment. Like, you know, I make a joke in Twitch chat, make people laugh because it's like, 
what, what kind of person tries to crack a joke while, while they're on pace, you know? I don't know, there, there's really nothing you can uh, do to remedy that, that nervousness. And overall, I don't know, the, the feeling of being on pace is just exciting to me. Because it's like, if it's been a while, it's like, oh shit, I gotta lock in. Um, I don't know, be, being on pace is just like a very enjoyable feeling. I mean, this one might be a little bit of a no-brainer, but I guess it's not necessarily a quality, more so just like an aspect of life, like, you know, enough free time. Mm -hmm. But I don't think spearing is like that wildly different from a lot of other skills that you try to practice for. I think if someone's like more practiced in a sport that they've done all their life or like, you know, they did it as a kid, like in that sense, it's probably going to be a bit easier to try and pick up something like spearing because if it's something like SM64 with the practice run, you can just press L to immediately reset. If you're trying to see something a little more intricate, a little more specific, you can just make a safe state and just like look at what's up, try different options. You know, like I'm sure a lot of other people would just say like discipline, like yeah, you, really all it takes to become a pretty good speedrunner, at least like get good fast is knowing how to learn. But sometimes a lot of people learn how to learn their speedrunning. Something I've been struggling with myself as well, cause like I'd say like I still practice and I still learn things, but uh, and I'm sure lots of other top runners as well. Currently, they're like half-assing stuff um, in terms of like practice and like, you know, the, the whole point with learning a skill and trying to improve and be better both as a person, as a player, and you know, what, whatever thing it is you're doing, hobby, skill, etc., is to just be disciplined enough and to always be looking for more places to grow. I think spearing specifically, you just want to you want to be good at being able to consider every single little possibility and consuming a lot of content where you can learn as much as possible. Um, and for something like SM64, it's pretty nice because you have the X cam sheet, which is just like uh, times and a lot of the time videos submitted by other players onto this wide spreadsheet. Um, you can compare a lot of the time. There's like some variety in the longer stars. Um, they're just like different movement choices. So if you're aware of all the possible movement choices on a star, then you can choose what either suits your taste, like whether you're trying to be as fast as possible or as consistent. I'm just like being able to understand and do things like that, where you, you consume all the relevant info and then try your best to apply it as much as you can. Um, being stubborn. Um, I don't know. My, my mom uh, mm -hmm. always called me cabezón, which is a uh, big headed. I'd say, you know, I'm just very stubborn, very big headed when it comes to things like 16 star. I just like, I don't know. It happens to a lot of people. They call it the, the 16 star trap. We're like, oh, I'll just get this time. And then they, they're like, oh, well, this time's pretty close to this time. So I should just go for that one already. And uh, it, it's just a pretty common trait. I'd say the first two years, so like 2018 to 2019, I spent a lot of time like not, not really interacting with the community a whole lot. And since I wasn't interacting with the community a whole lot, like I just like watch other streamers occasionally and see what they're doing. But it didn't really strike my mind like, oh, they're doing 70 star, 120 star, maybe I should do that. Cause like, I just, really, I just kind of kept to myself and a couple friends. And through that, I was just, I was just doing a bunch of 16 star. So I think probably the first year, first few years, probably would have been a pivotal point for me to learn other categories. But then I stuck with 16 star pretty much onwards. And like come 2020, like I was on the cusp of a sub 16, which, you know, ties back to the whole, oh, well, I'm pretty close to this time. I should just grind for it. I get my first 15. And then from there, you know, a bunch of people like start watching me more often because uh, I I'd started yapping in Zufi's chat, as I mentioned earlier. Um, people recognize me from there. They start watching me and then like, well, if they keep on watching 16 star, I may as well just keep on doing it. And I, I just kept on improving very gradually. And through that very gradual improvement, it just it kind of just got me closer and closer to, to the top times. I don't think there was a particular reason that I really hid my face. It was more so just like I didn't own a webcam at the time. And I, well, I started doing runs when I was 13, so pretty young. And like I, I've always taken uh, just like internet safety pretty seriously. You know, I don't want too many details about me out there. And I figured, you know, just being kind of faceless, like nobody really questioned it because nobody really watched me to begin with. But then pe more people started watching me. They're just like, well, I don't have a webcam, so I'm just gonna like be mysterious about it, which is also why I don't tell anyone what GTM stands for. Um, and it stands for, yeah, I really can't think of any actual reason I kept my face hidden other than not having a camera and then just keeping the bit going for the sake of the bit. Now, my feelings towards streaming honestly haven't changed that much. If anything, I think it, 
Well, I mean, it's a bit of a no-brainer that showing your face, having camera on, just like it adds another layer to the stream, adds more personality. And for a while when I had a only mic, no cam, I tried being a little more like nonchalant with my personality, um, just cause like, you know, it's cool to be like a little more stoic, but naturally I just like things slip out and it's just like, in reality, I just kind of like being silly from time to time. And I think having cam on also helps me express that quite a bit. But yeah, it was never really anything about like not being confident in my looks or anything, which I mean, let's be real, I'm a pretty handsome guy anyway, so no worries there. Do these shades make you feel supremely powerful? <laughs> yes, these shades, uh, they're actually, they actually are the source of my power. You know, they're, I mean, they're just like, they're a good tool. I specifically bought another pair of shades, which I have, I think it's in my controller bag, which isn't, um, not here. But like, so like you can see like, there's like a blind spot here because like your eyes can peep through and stuff. Um, so I bought another pair that just like completely wraps around. So like, if I, if I need to like look at something discreetly, I can ju I'll just turn around and like this will be covered and I just move my eyes. I mean, I don't know if you can even see my eyes through the light or the camera or anything, but yeah. Um, I don't know, it's also easier because like in some sense, it might disturb people because they can't see my eyes and they'll be like, is he looking at me? Is he not? But at the same time, that also makes it a great tool if I'm trying to be a snoop or I'm um, just trying to, you know, trying to be discreet. Um, I think a lot of it probably just came from like having a lot of time during the pandemic because like, so pandemic hits, everyone's indoors, you know, every, everyone lived through it or died. So I, you know, I was just at my PC all day like, hmm, I'm not running Mario. How can I, how can I make something funny about Mario 64 speedrunning? Or like what, what, what funny quip or thought can I post? Because like, you know, you just see like random funny tweets that are just like, sometimes they're just words, they're videos, they're memes or whatever. And I just like, okay, I'll just try to copy that. Um, and slowly but surely, you know, I, I got a little better with my ideas um, and it, it really just kind of snowballed from there. Now, a, a lot of the people, like even today, someone told me, I, I'm familiar with, the, with your 64 stuff, but I know you the best from your Twitter account. You're funny as hell, bro. I don't know, the idea of posting a banger is really fun because like if something makes me laugh, I have a pretty good feeling. Like I pop off because like I'm laughing, but I'm also popping off during the laughter because it's like, it's going to do numbers. This is funny as hell uh, and like uh, I'll DM it to some friends I'll, I'll be like is this funny if enough people see it and enough people get a laugh out of it then like that, that's all I want I want people to laugh at something good that I've created and you know it's, it's kind of hard to always achieve that but you know gotta gotta take in the rough with the smooth I mean I have ideas like for a while I thought it was a pretty uncreative person and like maybe in terms of like art or like drawing mm -hmm. uh, maybe in, Maybe there's untapped potential, but as, as far as I feel right now, like there's not a whole lot of creativity. But in something like comedy or like directing or recording skits, like sometimes I just get like random ideas, which a lot of the time makes me wish like I had a camera, like my own people to film with, like at any time, kind of like how a lot of older skit YouTube channels used to be. Because like sometimes I just get like a good enough idea. I'm like, yeah, that, that the pacing of that would probably be funny. So I don't know if I'd necessarily call it talent, but just like. I guess pretty much everyone and their ideas is just like the sum of all the content they've consumed. And then like it all just kind of becomes an amalgamation of that, um, which they then turn into like their own spin on comedy or like their own spin on a video. Um, but I, I definitely think I have at least some amount of potential and what I, I'd be able to create. Outside of Mario 64, like I really don't play that many other video games. And it's like, it's like some sort of multiplayer co-op game. And there's like a sort of a specific goal, like a very, like a concept of a game, like pretty much the whole game is just that specific concept and it's like relatively simple, but pretty much the only games I can revisit casually for solo play is uh, games I really enjoyed as a kid, including Luigi's Mansion. Um, I played Minecraft starting like, well I played, so on the old Minecraft website, there used to be a quit or like a nine, or a one, it was a 100 minute demo, I think. And like you'd install Java on your, on your browser and it let you play Minecraft for a bit. And then there was this exploit where like you could, you could go over the, the time limit and just keep on playing. That was late 2012. My cousins had gotten me into it. And I was like, dad, can you please buy me Minecraft? So like January, 2013, one of my cousins comes over because at the time, like buying things off a computer was like a little foreign to my parents. And I'm honestly foreign to me because I thought 
when you buy things online, like you put your card in the computer. But I, I was very wrong about that. So my cousin comes over, buys me Minecraft, and then 2013 to like 2017, 2018, like Minecraft was pretty much the main game that I played. It, it makes me wonder if like my life is written and there's, if there's like some sort of like sim symbolism or foreshadowing. But the first friend group I had made was around this time, 2014, so like summer 2014, on a Mario 64 themed Minecraft server. So I met a bunch of friends on there and then we pretty much just like, we, we made a couple servers and then we mainly hung out on this one guy's server and like Minecraft was pretty much the main game I played uh, for those uh, four years? No, three, five. You know, amount of years that I played Minecraft for. Other games I played in that time, I think Undertale is a pretty good game, very popular. Pretty much all of my childhood before I touched Mario 64 and Minecraft, it was just a bunch of Nintendo games, mostly Mario games, funnily enough. Played Paper Mario 64, I played Super Paper Mario, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, Dream Team, Bowser's Inside Story. I didn't play Partners in Time because I didn't have access to it. Super Mario 3D Land, Super Mario 3D World, Galaxy 1 and 2. I played a bit of Sunshine as a kid, but um, Sunshine sucks because Drogi pays me to say that. Tomodachi Life's a pretty good one. I tried playing that a bit on stream. If you don't know what Tomodachi Life is, because it's it's kind of niche, honestly. It's like 11 years old now. It was a 3DS game that was basically just kind of like Nintendo's take on The Sims almost, but with Miis and stuff. is It's a pretty good game, honestly. If you, if you look back through my Twitter account, there's a tweet that I posted in like 2020 or 2021 that was like, after I retire from SM64, because I thought it was just like, a thing that happens at some point more so than just like thinking of it as just a choice you might make. It, it was something like, after I retire from SM64, I will be looking into playing Melee competitively to expand my brain. Because like, after playing Melee, I, I, I realized this more, but also at the time I thought, damn, playing Melee, you gotta you got do so much big brain stuff. It's like, uh, there, there's just a lot of depth to the game. I, so I started playing shortly after OMSA had won the Big House 10, or nine one of, i think it was ten um i was in a call with one of my students katie hops and she was watching the tournament and i was like oh, what's going on oh smash I, okay i'll just watch and it was grand finals amsa won and like i barely understood anything that was going on so after he won i was like oh wait d did he win the, the whole tournament and she was like yeah he won the whole tournament i was like oh okay the start of last year 2023 uh, something else had also compelled me to start playing Melee. I think, I think it might have been right after JMook had won Genesis. I was like, okay, this game seems kind of interesting, Katie. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can link me up. So she sent me the stuff to set up Slippy, um, taught me a couple things. And pretty much from there, I started uh, just playing Melee a lot more. Um, but I did play Melee very briefly, not competitively, but very briefly with one of my friends. Well, one of the friends I met on that Mario 64 Minecraft server. Um, cause it, this was like 2018, I think he had gone to melee competitively at the time. He was a Luigi main. Um, he tried getting me to set up dolphin that play, which it, it was pretty terrible cause you know, everything pre slippy was just awful, but I tried setting it up and I didn't know anything about melee. So when I had finally gotten it set up and we were connected, I just randomly chose Dr. Mario on a whim. And I didn't know this, that this was like exclusive to melee, like the whole like fast feel and how like everything felt. But like when I played Dr. Mario, I was like, dude, this character feels so like fast and fluid. And if you know anything about, well, I mean, if you know anything about melee or to anyone watching who doesn't really know that much about melee, Dr. Mario isn't really like the fastest or the smoothest character to play. But I, my only experience with Smash games was Smash 4. Smash, well, all of them except melee pretty much. So I tried playing Melee and tried understanding some of the stuff with my friend. He tried teaching me how to wave dash and I, I was able to remember it when I started learning the game in depth last year. Um, but I just remember thinking after that short session with a terrible Wi-Fi, I was like, hmm, I think I'll just main Dr. Mario the next time I feel like playing this game. And then I didn't touch Melee uh, until 2023, early 2023. So that, that's pretty much the only reason I, I started choosing Dr. Mario because it's just like, Back in my mind, I was like, yeah, I'll just play him again next time I play. And then, you know, next time I played was five years later, but I kept my promise to myself. If I, if I had the same amount of free time that I did uh, when I started speed running, so like pretty much just like uh, late middle school or like freshman in high school to senior, 
if I had that same amount of free time and not like have to worry about responsibilities or anything like that, I am pretty confident that I could probably get something like top 100 with solo Dr. Mario. I don't know, I, I think it's good to be confident in yourself. And like Melee, there's just like a bottomless pit of depth and things to learn. But I feel like a lot of those concepts I can apply with enough time. Uh, I don't know about like big tournament placements or anything like that, but I definitely think if I had that same amount of free time that I had growing up and a similar enough motivation to speedrunning, because like now that I know how to like be pretty in depth with practice and the much wider array of coaches you have in Melee, like I, I could probably progress pretty fast, but for now Melee is more just like an on the side thing. Like I, I slowly um I slowly and progressively improve at the game, just like at my own pace, just because like, you know, it's fun to keep things self-paced rather than like always try harding. With speedrunning, there's always the immediate obvious goal of another minute barrier to break. And melee it's uh there there is ways to structure your improvement and all that, but the goals aren't necessarily always as clearly defined. Um, Siglemic. So when you interviewed Beast Assassin, or as I know him, Kavari, because you know we're chill. Like actually, I, I should mention that he was actually one of the first people I spoke to in the community. Him and another friend, Jer, J E R E five four one. So Jer, I met on a Minecraft server. He played on his brother's account, and then he just kind of inherited his username, Jer. Um, so I'd hop on this Minecraft server, and he'd be like, "Yo, are you the one, or are you his brother?" Because like he just go on that server occasionally, and then a couple months later. He spots me in a Twitch chat, because at the time, my Twitch name was RacingMan1. He spots me in a Twitch chat, and he's like, Yo, it's you from the Minecraft server, what's up? And I think we were watching Simply stream, actually, in like 2017, 2018. He's like, Yo, what's good? You speedrun this game or something? He's like, Haha, yeah. So we hit it off from there, and then Jer was friends with Kavari. Um, so those two, I have pretty vivid memories, um, where we just do like 16-star races and Discord calls pretty early on. Um, I remember... Me, me and Jared got in the exact same time. It was like an 18.02 or something in a race, but neither of us knew how to read time. Back to my main point. When you had interviewed Kavari, he brought up that he was watching a Siglemic stream and he had, um, had Siglemic was ending stream and he raided a melee stream, Kings of Cali, one of, one of the tournaments they had held. Um, so I think Siglemic playing melee was probably a huge part because like after the Smash documentary release, like it, melee just exploded in terms of players player base grew, the community grew stronger from all of that. Um, and I don't know Siglemic's exact history with Melee, but I do know that he uh, he got like 65th in like 2015 at some uh, reasonably sized tournament. So I think Siglemic playing and watching Melee is probably, had to have contributed uh, in some degree. But I think, I don't know, I think they're both pr pretty just like fun games, very fun movement, very fun physics. Um, it's just like kind of addicting to practice because like even if you're solo practicing tech skill and maybe like wave dashing like even simple basic fundamental things like wave dashing l canceling like it's still like just like fun to grind out and then if you have a friend melee being a party game obviously i mean you just like you can you can just mess around with your friends you can mess around with friends that like are more competitive it's very accessible in my opinion then the inverse being melee players and in getting into speed running i think well, there's definitely a lot of overlap, more so in the mental aspect when it comes to being a competitor. Because while speedrunning is, well, fundamentally, it should be centered around just like self-improvement, there is the aspect of competition that comes from trying to get a good time on a leaderboard. So I think people might be driven to like try and get a good time fast, or maybe they just want to try and get a good time, or they, they get, you know, a couple Melee friends, you know, they got their GameCube controllers and their adapters, hook it up to Project 64, they have a little friendly competition. And then from there, it just kind of it kind of spirals, and it's it's the same thing with speedrunners. Just like maybe some of them are kind of into Smash casually, and then it just kind of uh, envelops from there. Uh, I feel like I feel like everyone is into a wide variety of genres. Things that come to mind immediately, mm -hmm. just like random jazz that I get on YouTube. Uh, there's this Japanese ambience album series by this uh, uh, Japanese artist. I for I forgot his name. Um, but it's just like these peaceful ambience albums, very relaxing. I like listening to those occasionally just because like it's music, but it's very like laid back. It's not like an intense melody that you have to like be listening to to like enjoy it. It's just like it's nice background noise. It's very pleasant. Funnily enough, a lot of fucking soundtracks from other Mario games I played as a kid uh, just because, you know, Koji Kondo, uh, some are saying he's like outdone Beethoven in his entire discography. 
uh, which I agree with, honestly. I'm a very big fan of the Beatles. If you were to play one second of any Beatles song, or even less than a second, I, I'm pretty confident I could pretty much name all of the, the, all the titles of the song based off that one second. I really like the Beatles. My cousin got me into them. I actually remember the first Beatles song I listened to was a Do You Want to Know a Secret, which there's nothing good about that song, but I just thought it was interesting because I had never heard it before. There's this one indie group. They don't really make music anymore. They released two albums in like 2006 or like around that time. It was Tally Hall. Um, I, like, I, like, I like their two albums they released. They got some nice, unique sounding music. There was a kind of like breakcore DNB, drum and bass. Um, I like listening to that a bit just because like the pacing of a lot of DNB songs is just like the sounds of like, you know, drums and bass. It just, it works very well together in my opinion, especially when practicing something like speed running. It just makes me like, kind of gives me that sense of like importance or like I'm locked in, you know? Well, yeah, the same cousin that got me into the Beatles also tried getting me into playing bass guitar. So that cousin, like, you know, we were pretty chill growing up, but like I, I'd always wanted a brother, but I never had a brother. So in some ways he was kind of like a brother to me because like, you know, we were related by blood to some degree, obviously, because we're cousins. Um, so I tried learning bass guitar, but like I didn't really have any like good guidance. I wasn't really locked in with the learning. So I never really got far like at all with bass guitar. I do think learning an instrument is quite possibly like one of the most important things and useful things that any able human can do with their life. Music just like has so much depth, you know, but that kind of goes without saying. It just makes you feel things, makes you feel emotions. Just... That's, that's why I think learning an instrument is pretty important, but I don't really have the motivation or the patience to really learn one at the moment, but I think, I think at some point I'll probably pick something up. Uh, I would want to try something a bit more niche, maybe like a, the Ocarina or something. Not because I like Zelda. Because Ocarina of Time is mid, but yeah, I'll probably try an instrument at some point. Ooh. I'm not sure if there are any particular, well, there probably is like some sort of story that maybe stuck out with me at some point as a kid. I mean, I have memories of shows I watched, but like, yeah, I, I can't really think of any stories that really stuck with me. I have fond memories of watching uh, <laughs> Back at the Barnyard, um, Spongebob, I feel like, you know, pretty much everyone's watched Spongebob. I don't know what kids are watching these days, but hopefully it's still Spongebob. I did watch a bit of Spanish programming, La Rosa de Guadalupe. It was just like a Spanish drama. In Spanish, they're called telenovelas, but you know, it's just like Spanish dramas. <laughs> Some of them are cheesy as fuck. There's, a, there's this one scene, I don't know if it was from that show, but there's this one scene where like this parent was like, are you emo? He's like, no, no, I'm not emo. But the guy sounded so, uh, you know, he sounded fruity. And it's just like it, the whole pacing and directing that scene was just so awkward because like he had a little bit of eye shadow and his hair was slicked back. And he was like, eres emo, eres emo, que no, no soy emo. He sounded like that. Other Spanish shows I watched, uh, El Chavo del Ocho. Pretty popular one. Anyone who grew up speaking Spanish probably knows about it. Animes I've enjoyed, however. I just feel like all the popular ones I always enjoy. And I, I mean, it makes sense because, you know, they're popular for a reason. Uh, I just recently finished watching Death Note with Ouija, um, like a week before Pace. And it's just like, dude, the first half of that anime is so good. And like the second half is still enjoyable, but the first half of the Death Note is just so good. It's, anytime I watch a really good show, like I, I try to not make it my whole personality or whole the way I think like a certain character, but like, you know, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to occasionally think like, hmm, what, what would this character do in this scenario? Just like, you know, it's, it's a way of keeping myself entertained in some, in some scenarios. And like, if I'm with a friend that I watched it with, or I know they watched it and like, we, we hear something that like we could reference, I'll be, I'll be like, was that a ref? Actually, I watched Doraemon a bit as a kid and it's like this blue cat robot sent from the future to take care of this kid. I think his name was like, I think it was Nobi, I don't know. The show was kind of for kids too, but it was, it was anime and uh, Doraemon's from the future. Like, and he'll like, he's a cat and he has like this pouch thing here and like he'll just like pull it and then like pull out a gadget. Um, sometimes it'd be like a propeller and like pretty much the entire episode would be centered around whatever gadget's going on. And like usually Nobi like fucks up and it's, it was a very basic plot, but I, I enjoyed watching that as a kid. Cowboy Bebop. 
pretty good. I have to rewatch it. It's actually been like four years now. I did watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure when that was like the popular meme on the internet like five years ago. But I mean, in some aspects, it's like pretty good. But overall, I don't think it's like, I think it's a little overhyped, honestly. Um, none of them. I hate the hobby. <laughs> I think all the paces are very memorable because like mm -hmm. at home, uh, pretty much everyone I hung out with at school, like, you know, they've all graduated now. They're all off to college or doing whatever the hell. So I'm pretty lonely, which like sometimes it drives me insane, which yeah, I mean, makes sense. But like a lot of the time I'm able to handle it pretty fine. Um, it's for that reason that like hanging out at pace and the memories and just like all the jokes and all the photos I take, like they're just that much more potent. In terms of uh, just like specific memories of me spearing at home and stuff uh, throughout my career, um, I don't know, that, that's a little harder to think of. He's not really in the community as much anymore, but I think you, Genix, remember Ben York 36. <laughs> he was a bit of a annoying, often unpleasant person, but still like tolerable enough to be in the community. He was in like Liam's chat, Zufi's chat, and I remember I raced him on Zufi's stream and Zufi commentated it. It's not necessarily a fond or beloved memory, but it was, it was a bit of a funny one that I, that I do recall. Watching Slip's face reveal was pretty huge. I don't know how many people know this, because I feel like, well, if you've been around in the community long enough, like 2020 or so, uh, you'll know. But for anyone who doesn't, um, Slip started doing 16 runs frequently again in like 2018. Punke, like pretty much near the end of 2018, posts this tweet. And he's like, hmm, I think I have a conspiracy theory. Um, I think Slippery Nip is Siglemic on an alt account because 16 stars is a simple enough category to, to de-rust the game. He never uses cam, he never uses mic. And I saw that tweet and I just like, I genuinely thought, dude, what if it's actually Siglemic? So I started watching Slip late 2018 thinking, all right, this guy's gotta be Siglemic. I gotta get to the bottom of this. Uh, but my de my detective skills weren't as sharp at the time. Um, but then, like, seeing Slip face reveal after a couple months after he started using Mike again, it was exciting because, like, you know, it's like an enigma just, like, reveals itself. My first 15, uh, I, I, I popped off probably still the hardest I've ever popped off. <laughs> Let's go! I've been so many times when I wanted to give up. I actually like intentionally overplayed my reaction when I got my first 14. Cause like, I, I think in general, I've gotten pretty much better at just like controlling like overwhelming excitement and emotions. Like I, I'm able to dial it back when I want to most of the time. Um, so that 14, I definitely turned it up. But my, my pop off after I got my first 15, it was just like, it literally just felt like such crazy euphoria. Cause like, from, from the star grab to like the, when Peach appears and stuff, like that was just me popping off. And then I had a, a couple moments of silence. I was looking up and then like, I remember again that I got a 15 and like all the feelings just rushed in again. And I just like, I, and you can tell the emotion in my voice where I was like, I did it. I really did it. It was just such a good time. Um, so getting a 15, obviously very memorable. Definitely the strongest I've ever felt playing the game. Getting my 14 was also pretty big just because, you know, my first 14, pretty monumental. Um, I think I was, I can't remember if I was fifth when I got the 1456 or not, um, but I'm fifth currently and probably, I don't know for how long. I don't think it'll last unless I start doing runs again or whatever, but mm, other memories. I remember meeting Suiji pretty vividly at the airport for Pace Summer 2023 last year. I was DMing him, his phone died and I was like, uh, well, his phone's probably dead because he's not responding. So I just started walking around uh, like the bottom floor of BWI and then I, I walked past him and was like, hey, I know you. Uh, there's just, there's so much like, I guess Ouija's 1517 because that was like the very big pivotal thing that really just like pushed me toward running 16 star. There's just, there's just so much memories, a lot of niche things that only I remember, but it's, it's hard to recall. I need like a trip of shrooms or something to really recall everything accurately. You got any? <laughs> well, Suiji improving really fast made me feel like shit initially. Cause like, you know, he blew me out of the water and like obviously you shouldn't tie your ego and self-worth to your time on a leaderboard, but it's hard to not do. Felt like shit for a while, but overall, like ignoring my ego, 
pretty awesome to see. Like, arguably the best player besides me and Ouija to touch the game. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's just exciting seeing him kick ass. I like the guy. Uh, I'm very relieved that he's not like a he's not a smarmy prick or anything. Like, not not that I would expect him to, but like, you know, there would be like the slight fear that like, what if one day there's a there's a top runner that's just like good, but he has a huge ego, kind of like Paracusia, um, except he never really got that good. Yeah, I mean, Suiji's a fun guy. Very pleasant to talk to when he's not uh, <laughs> when he's not spouting his uh, Suijiisms. <laughs> um, and Trey, pretty exciting. Don't want him to beat my time though. Uh, which thankfully he hasn't, uh, so I don't have to run the game. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean I don't know. They're they're both very respectful people overall. Very chill. Uh, it's always exciting to see them do whatever it is they're doing. I know Trey's doing a lot of YouTube content right now. It's really awesome to see him doing well on that YouTube Shorts. Especially he's blowing up. He's uh, done a couple uh, history videos now. Zero Star and Dark World Reds. Um, and Suiji. I don't know what he's doing with the game too much right now. I, he's been doing 120, I know, but I don't know what like he where he is mentally with uh, like his goals and stuff. But yeah, love them both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say it probably has a bright future overall. Just like the community is pretty much in a perpetual state of always improving. Because mm -hmm. like if you look back like five, six years ago when I started, um, some aspects of community culture, well, while they weren't socially unacceptable, admittedly some were overall like it might have been a little more unpleasant if like the community stayed the same culturally but every, everyone's pretty chill everyone's pretty respectful um and, I, and i'm glad it's uh it's being that way the future of the game and the community i'm not too sure about at some point the game's just going to be pretty damn optimized that people will probably just play to get close to world records rather than actually contesting the world record um but i don't know how far off that is in a in a call I did with Circa Mark, Adam Pass, and a lot of other Japanese players, and also some a lot of English speaking runners, Circa Mark was saying that he thinks the game's gonna be solved by 2025. Another Japanese runner was explaining that like he thinks I think it was Gamiru who said it. He he explained how Circa Mark thinks the game is pretty much done, solved next year, and all the Japanese runners are always like, "What do you mean, bro? It's next year." And then Circa was like, well, if it's not by 2025, then maybe 2030 the game will be solved. And it's hard to be so sure about things like that because I mean, it's just like there's too many variables. There's too many things to really be able to make an accurate prediction of the future. But it wouldn't surprise me if this game's still pretty much like thriving by 2030 because like game's fun, movement's fun. Community's always improving, it seems. Sticks uh, are becoming a little more plentiful in terms of, a, you know, CL6 and stuff. Um, I did suggest that instead of like, so originally the meme was in the SM64 Discord, people would be like, okay, uh, when, when are you doing X? You're like, when's 14, 2020, when's 46, 2020, which funnily enough, both those times did happen. Those barriers were broken in 2020. And then people were like, okay, uh, let's just move to 2025. So tying back to Circumrex saying, well, by 2030. So I was thinking, we we just push it to 2064 because like 64 mario 64 and like in my mind 2064 looks like the 20xx equivalent in in melee and if you don't know um in melee the the meme is like the year is 20xx everyone only plays fox because fox is the best character at an optimal level and hypothetically in melee the year is 2064 sm64 is so optimized we, uh, and, you know, like the game just like looks so completely different and just like fucked up to what it is now or something. Runners go through steel sticks every attempt. I think overall the game is a very bright future. Well, with Mario and streaming, I think I'd still like to be competitive. I still like to get top times. I think my main plan is, but I'm not too confident if I'll stick to it, um, is uh, start learning and grinding 120 after this pace. So as soon as I get home, I'll probably just like start learning more stars and stuff. Cause a lot of people in the community, like if you if you look above surface level stuff in the community, which is like pretty much like I'd say surface levels like Suiji, Cheese, Ouija, like the really big guys, simply Liam. You look past that, you look to some other people in the community. Uh, I might pop up or I might pop up under just the speedrunners Twitter feed because I tweet a lot. So with that like sort of notoriety I have now. Um, if I start running 120, you know, the most popular category, and I get like relatively good at it, like 
it, if I if I were to like really thoroughly learn, I'd want to give it my my all my all um, and try to try to get really competitive times. If people see me doing the most popular category and they recognize me, maybe they'll start watching because a lot of people just love watching 120. Um, so that's probably what I hope my future is with streaming. I kind of have to just like lock in because I'm a very I know I have a what's considered a top time in Mario, but I still feel like a very undisciplined person and very just like lazy. Maybe that's me being modest to some degree, but I feel like with the right learning and just like understanding how to learn and how it, like maybe things come to you more intuitively and all that stuff, you could you could probably become a top player with enough free time and just like knowing how to learn. And I think pretty much a perfect example of that is Suiji. So yeah, that's probably my future if I'm able to lock in with 120. My plans and hopes for my life are that I'm financially stable enough, just in general, it doesn't have to be a great, I don't know, like sometimes I get like deep and philosophical about, oh, what are my goals? What do I want to do with my life? But then I think, yeah, I'm sure you, anyone has seen like a video of like older people, you know, senior citizens, where like they ask like, well, uh, what do you have some advice for younger people? And it's always very simple advice. And like if, they're, if it's always the old people saying the very simplistic sentences, then I probably don't need to overcomplicate things nearly as much though. Life probably has to be complicated to some degree, just because that's how, I guess, just a lot of things in society are structured or whatever. I just want to be happy. I want to hang out with friends more. I want to, I don't know. I, I feel like I can do something meaningful with my life. Like, I feel like I have the potential as long as I'm always just like, as long as I don't remain complacent for too long, I always try to chase something big. I think speedrunning has a decent future in esports, but at the same time, it's a... Uh, it's hard to not be, it's hard, it's hard to be optimistic about esports when things are always just like kind of falling apart, especially in Smash Bros. But I think if there's enough people with a dream and optimism and ideally money, then I think speedrunning can last for quite a while. Overall, I don't know if I have a future in esports necessarily. It's more just like a general hope I have for speedrunning and esports in general. Um, bless you to have your sneeze, I guess. Even if I'm not doing competitive stuff with Mario, like I still want to be within the community. I still want to be posting Twitter and stuff. Like, I still want to be an active part of the community that helps out people. Um, and even if I'm not like helping out people or contributing to the community that much, like I still want to be bridging the gap between um, other speedrunning pros and other speedrun communities, and like possibly other gaming communities too. Which is like kind of what I've started doing with Melee. I started watching some Clone Hero streamers, so like I just want to I want to bridge that gap. I want a lot of these more niche gaming communities to be a lot more intertwined with each other. I think once there's like more unity in that sense, then like these niche communities can really start to thrive. my ass bro what I'm back I'm back what qualities do you think you need in order to become a good speedrunner autism